Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I'm your host today. Today our, ge our guest is Sammy Alloy. Sammy is a uh, organizer with the Oregon Working Families Party. And so welcome to the show, Sammy. Thanks so much for having me, David. It's a okay. pleasure to be here. All right, yeah. In part, I invited you uh, because you had done this video uh, with the B Media Collection mm -hmm. and uh, we had them on last week. So. Uh, for a any in our audience who didn't get to see that, well, by all means, go to our YouTube channel and take a look at that uh, really interesting uh, interview we did with uh, with the uh, B Media uh, Collective people. But uh, so that was part of it. So we want to show the the video that sure. you did, uh, but we also want to talk about your role with the Oregon Working Families Party and what the Working Families Party is. Uh, so actually, why don't we start with the video? Great. Okay. We used to have a really highly subsidized, high quality system of public higher education in this country, but since then we've had a huge decline in public financing for higher education. There's been a massive decrease in state funding. We've had a decline in federal financing. So students have had to pick up that slack. In 2010, Oregon grads averaged $24,000 in debt. At the same time, their earning power is diminished. Real wages are flat or falling for young people. People are saddled with this debt. It's now more than a trillion dollars nationally. These loans are on draconian terms. They can be very hard to get out from under. And this is despite the fact that the federal government guarantees those loans. So there is no risk to these lenders, but they're putting our young people in debt peonage. It's a tremendous disincentive to higher education. It's also a tremendous disciplinary device on young people. If you have a debt like that, your freedom to change the direction of your life is really limited, and really even to speak up. You need to keep your head down and keep your job with a debt like that. We're having a huge shift of resources from people in their teens, their 20s, their 30s, to people who are older, but it's really to the financial sector. It's to Wall Street, it's the 1%, it's the banks, and it's a shift of resources to people who will not be spending their money in ways that cause positive developments in the economy. We let ourselves believe we can't afford to invest in higher education. And that's despite the fact that we're the richest country in the world. We have a tremendous military budget. We're at the state level prioritizing incarceration. The public has to retake on paying for higher education as a social, public, communal obligation and investment in our future. Wonderful. So uh, that that video you did with no experience prior to working on that. That's right. I've been an activist for you know most my ad entire adult life and part of my teenagerhood, and I've never really had a good handle on technology like many of us. You know, like so many of us, you know, we're in it for the interpersonal organizing and the movement building, but not really, you know, developing that. Uh, technological skill with uh, you know empowering ourselves to make our own media so I was really excited when B Media offered the class they do great work and I found the class very empowering and uh, I um, was really excited to have Dr. Mary King accessible to me she's a great uh, friend uh, and someone who is an ally to the Working Families Party and has really helped us with our debt-free higher education campaign so I had had some technological diff difficulties with the camera I had been using, so I ended up you know, just really pulling a lot of footage from YouTube and from footage that other allies in the community had gotten from uh, you know, student debt marches in Portland and was able to pull together a video collage just uh, with Mary's excellent, concise analysis of the student debt crisis. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was very impressed with it as a, as oh, a first you. attempt to, to do <laughs> what was really very high quality. So, 
kudos to you and to the Bee Collective for uh, for getting that. For Thanks. Getting that so why 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 did you choose that topic? Because you 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 took the class as a representative of the Working Families Party, uh, and the I think the instruction was to produce a video about the party or, or about the issues of the party. Right. That is the case. Uh, the Working Families Party does have as a core platform, uh, you know, access to debt-free education. So that's been a really important issue for us, and we were in the midst of launching a campaign around it. So uh, I did feel that it was uh, really relevant as an outreach tool to let folks know that you know this is an issue that the Working Families Party really cares about. Uh, you know, initially I had. Uh, started to do interviews with uh, activists that are really active with the party and as I mentioned I had difficulties I had a, a buzz on my microphone and so in the end I ended up just really focusing in on that that one issue and it's been great you know I do a lot of work uh, organizing on campuses and I think that students really need to see an issue that's relevant to them and need to see it broken down in a way that it's really accessible because you know, there's, there's so many issues that are sort of vying for students' attention mm -hmm. uh, in this moment, and that's one that r has really personally affected me. I have student debt, and so does just about everyone I know, uh, you know, coming from a working class or middle class background. And so, I, uh, you know, everyone at the party just really feels like this is a very critical issue for our economic recovery, and, uh, you know, f increasingly is, is uh, you know, debt is creating a barrier to higher education that we need to have an, you know, prosperous and equitable society. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that this is part of, uh, this is in part a barrier, barrier to an economic recovery. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely, David. I just think we need to have an educated populace in order to have uh, a healthy society in order to uh, to be able to compete uh, in the global market and also, you know, just to to have a populace that is, uh, you know, really able to to be successful and um, to create, uh, you know, access to the kinds of sectors that, you know, that the U.S. needs in order to move forward, especially when you look at green technology and the, the kind of uh, energy sectors that we're going to need to move forward into a world with increasing, you know, global climate change being the crisis that it is. You know, I think part of the problem is that because of neoliberalism and economic policies that the U.S. has seen over the last 30 years, the U.S. is becoming a deindustrialized nation, and our uh, equality gap is just growing and growing. Uh, and so I think in order to, to really uh, nip that, that chasm inequality in the bud and, and really keep people uh, having access to the middle class, we need to provide working class and middle class families with access to education. And you know, it never used to be this way that people would end up $25,000 in debt after you know, going to undergrad people that are obviously going you know, to medical school are ending up $150,000 in debt. I'm sure you remember uh, you know, a generation ago, people were able to go to school uh, for free or for a nominal fee. And it's um, tuition as a, um, as a portion of median income has grown just since 1990 from 10% to 26% in the state of Oregon. And I think that that's really telling that you know, working class people aren't earning more, but we're paying more to send our mm -hmm. kids to college. Mm -hmm. And it really, um, you know, we get young people that are really weighing whether or not they're going to be able to make key life decisions, investing in the economy, investing in a home, starting a family, starting a small business, and they're having to delay those decisions because of their debt load. 
and uh, you know I know even on a personal level my I like to bank locally uh, because I you know believe that having a strong local financial sector is is key to economic growth and my credit union uh, is very wary to give me a line of credit because of my student debt my debt to income ratio and I think that's the case for a lot of people so it really hinders people being able to move away from those Wall Street banks that cause this financial collapse and really invest in our local economy. Yeah. So in, in answer to my question, you covered <laughs> a tremendous amount I of did. ground, I, which, I, which I love because they're all so related to each other. So thank you for doing that. I was really thinking in terms of students, it, you know, in a more immediate sense, students that are straddled with debt uh, have to pay the debt. Right. Uh, and when they do that, they're not buying the goods and services that actually fuel the economy that creates jobs. That's true. It's just exactly like Mary said in the video, we're seeing a tremendous shift of resources from young people to the financial sector, and that's just creating a, a growing uh, gap and a shrinking middle class. So we need to you know, be empowering our young people to make the kinds of investments in the economy that their parents were able to right. do. Yeah, and so does the uh, Working Families Party have a specific uh, proposal? Or we do. Okay. Talk, yes, talk about uh, that. it's <coughs> a concept called Pay It Forward, and uh, it is in part uh, similar to the system that they use in Australia and New Zealand, where students at local at um, public community colleges universities and um, trade programs would have access to higher education with no upfront tuition. They would uh, go to school uh, without having to, to pay any tuition upfront and in exchange they would sign a binding agreement that they would pay back into a fund be it with the state of Oregon or with their institution that'll depend on how the bill gets written uh, but they would pay into a fund a, a small percentage of their income for a set number of years so a community college grad would pay about 1.5 percent of their adjusted gross income a four-year grad would pay about three percent for 20 years and that would be paid uh, conceivably as a payroll deduction similarly to how we pay our Social Security um, and Medicare taxes so that they have a dependable amount that they're paying each month and it's not a debt uh, it accrues no interest there's no fees there's no default you know with student loans you can never declare bankruptcy you can never be free of those loans this is going to give pa people a path to have access to their education and then as their income hopefully grows uh, the more years they're out of school hopefully you know 20 years after you've graduated you're making a lot more than you did when you had just graduated and so that fund will grow and the set percentage that people will be paying in um, you know will be a percentage of a higher income and uh, will create a stable funding stream mm -hmm. for our universities and community yeah. colleges. And then initially where do the funds come from? It'll take some transitional funding and uh, we are talking to uh, State Treasurer Wheeler as well as uh, other legislators about where that could come from. Potentially it could come in the form of bonding capacity or a private sector grant. Um, it could come from an allocation from the legislature or all of the above. Oh, okay, all right, so to be determined. Yes. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. So this is, this is one concrete proposal that the Oregon Working Families Party has. And I think one of the real values of, of minor parties is that you are able to come up with these kinds of ideas that the major parties just don't seem to be able to wrap their heads around. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I think that, um, you know, as we're talking to legislators in the major parties, it's uh, the, the it's being met with some, um, it's not being rejected. I think it's being met with uh, some amount of interest, but I think due to the nature of our political system, the two-party system where each party is, uh, you know, always trying to filibuster what the other party is doing so that they can, you know, take that to the next election and say, we were able to accomplish this and the other person wasn't able to accomplish anything. People aren't going to put those really innovative, outside-of-the-box issues out on the table, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for fear of, 
you know, seeming too progressive or, you know, uh, of, you know, it's just they don't want to put their head on the chopping block. And I think the power of minor parties, particularly the Working Families Party, because we use fusion voting, we cross-nominate candidates from other parties so that we can build coalition with those parties, you know, that we're able to put those proposals on the table and really influence the dialogue and push the two major parties to be more accountable and to work together to think of creative solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk about fusion voting. Sure, fusion <coughs> voting uh, is the system that the entire country used to have until it was outlawed in the populist era because uh, populist mm -hmm. candidates populist era was about what time? Um, the late 19th century, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, what it is is that, uh, as I mentioned, a candidate can run as a member of more than one party. In full fusion, which is uh, what the system they have in New York, um, on your ballot you would see a bubble with a candidate's name and their parties. Let's call it Jeff Merkley. So it's, you know, bubble, Jeff Merkley, Democrat. On a separate line, you would have bubble, Jeff Merkley, Working Families Party. So that when people vote, you can vote along the party lines of the party that you're registered to vote with, but you can vote for the same candidate. And when the votes get counted, you can see which party influenced the vote in which ways, even though all those votes get fused together into a pool for that candidate. In Oregon, we have what's uh, colloquially known as fusion light, where you have a bubble, a candidate, and then Democrat slash Working Families Party or Republican, comma, Working Families Party, so that all of those votes get fused together, but we're not able to count which votes came from the Working Families Party. And I think that's fairly disempowering to minor parties uh, and the influence that we're able to have. But, uh, you know, it is key to how we work, and it has been proven to be a really successful organizing tool for us in the past. Mm -hmm. okay. D does the uh, Working Families Party have plans on uh, pushing the legislature to doing full fusion? Uh, it is something that we hope to do, but it's also a capacity issue for us. You know, we have a very small staff, and we really try to work strategically to get legislation passed that has a chance of passing in you know, the next year or following year. And we work in coalition with uh, community partners in the nonprofit sector. Uh, we have an ally table um, called the Working Families Organization, where we invite organizations like Jobs with Justice, Friends of Family Farmers, the Rural Organizing Project, and a host of others to, uh, to share with us what their legislative agenda is. And then we uh, work together to, um, to sort of use our uh, power in the electoral system uh, and our lobbying power to get those bills passed. And, uh, you know, right now we have uh, a legislative agenda that we're really excited about, but we just don't have the bandwidth for fusion voting at this sure. time. Okay, all right. A and so talk about the, the other components of your legislative agenda. Sure. So, uh, as I mentioned, Pay It Forward is figuring largely in there. Uh, you know, we do uh, feel like student debt is a, a critical issue that we're excited to be working on in the coming year. Uh, additionally, we work a lot on local banking issues, uh, and um, our flagship issue in the past has been the state bank. Uh, you know, in North Dakota, they have a state bank, and they've weathered the uh, economic crisis fairly well because of that. You know, it's a virtual bank that uh, the state treasury uses. It's not a consumer brick-and-mortar bank. And it, uh, it, 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 as it's conceived of in Oregon, or, or, or right, in it's not a bank that a consumer would go in and open a checking oh, account okay. with. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a state bank in terms of it's uh, you know, the central bank of the state of North Dakota. Uh, and so in Oregon, what that would look like would be that the state treasury would partner with local banks and community credit unions to engage in participation lending using the you know nine billion plus dollars that we have in the Oregon Short Term Fund, sort of also known as the state's cash. Uh, and so the state would engage in participation lending with uh, community banks that would sort of, it would boost those local banks' lending capacity because they would have the partnership of the state and we would invest the state's, the taxpayers' dollars in small businesses, 
family farms, local investments that would help build our uh, you know, local economy rather than as it stands right now, we invest uh, the state short-term fund in uh, bank accounts and corporate notes with Wells Fargo, Wachovia, uh, Goldman Sachs, Coca-Cola, many others. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are um, continuing to push for um, to get closer to having a state bank. Uh, in 2011, we brought the state bank to the state legislature, and what we ended up with was the Oregon Investment Act, which established the Oregon Growth Board. Uh, it has some components of uh, local financial sector development, but it really is not a state bank. And so we're going to continue to um, push the state treasury to, uh, to go in the direction of the state bank. We're also working on um, numerous local, um, municipal and county level local banking initiatives, asking municipalities and counties to um, invest the taxpayers' dollars locally to the greatest extent possible. And um, in addition to that, we are uh, working on an issue called Aggie Bonds that uh, would help um, s local small farmers uh, and first-time farmers to be able to uh, get some investment capital and build some equity. Okay, and, and that's actually a major problem. I, I, you know, it's not a problem that ever makes the headlines, but right. the ability of farmers to actually get money, uh, particularly new farmers, uh, to get money to actually finance their operations is very, very difficult. Absolutely, and you know, I think it really comes back to the Working Families Party's core platform of um, you know local, um, you know, good governance, healthcare, jobs, and education, and you know, building our local financial sector. You know, we really uh, are trying to work for working uh, working class voters and. Uh, middle-class voters, be it in both rural and urban areas, to be able to sort of work together to build some common um, political capital. And you know, when you're looking at across the nation what is happening to our rural areas and our uh, family farms, uh, sort of toppling because they're not able to compete with uh, you know large uh, multinational corporations. You know, I think. Um, Having a really healthy family farming sector is really critical not only to our food security and uh, you know our health as a populace, but also to the, the the sort of equity and strength of our local economy. Okay, all right. So uh, we have about a minute, minute and a half left. Uh, other uh, working families parties other than Oregon? Uh, yeah, New York has a really strong Working Families Party. They're known for their great field effort. They're excellent grassroots organizers, and they work in coalition with numerous uh, different 501c3s in the New York, New York area. There's also a nascent party starting in Washington State. Mm -hmm. There are um, there's one in Connecticut, uh, South Carolina, and um, I think also Pennsylvania. To the degree that uh, states across the union have fusion voting, that's where the Working Families Party is oh, able okay. to get a, mm -hmm. a stronghold. Okay, all right. And, and how do Oregonians or in other states where there might be parties, how, how, do, how do ordinary citizens like myself get involved with the party? I think the best thing that people can do to help build the Working Families Party movement is to change their voter registration to become a Working Families Party voter because that really builds our lobbying capacity and it really helps uh, our uh, ability to uh, work in coalition with the two major parties and influence the direction of that discourse. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, David. All right, great. So we've been talking with uh, Sammy Alloy, with, uh, an organizer with the Oregon Working Families Party today. If you'd like more information about the Oregon Working Families Party, you can find it at their website, www.oregon.org. P wfp.org and if you like that video would like to watch it again it is available at tinyurl.com slash or student debt uh, future action that folks here in the uh, Portland area might be involved with um, get on the bus Portland get on the bus Oregon the bus on December 1st going to the Peach Peace Arch in Blaine, Washington. Join your brothers and sisters, labor leaders, trade justice and food sovereignty groups. 
farm, family farmers, immigration reformers, public health advocates, environmentalists, students, and democracy advocates like the Alliance for Democracy from Canada, Mexico, and the United States to, to flush the TPP. The TPP? That's Obama's Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's Obama's first free trade agreement. That's NAFTA on steroids. The TPP will be the largest trade agreement since the 1995 WTO agreement. Join the historic cross-border organizing rally and summit to launch a new tri-national campaign to defeat the TPP. Get on the free bus from Portland. Contact the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign at 503 Seven three six nine seven seven seven, or email at elizabeth at organfairtrade.org. More information on the TPP is available at citizenstrade.org slash ctc slash Oregon. Or read the excellent overview of the TPP and past free trade agreements in the article on salon.com titled Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Biggest Trade Deal You've Never Heard Of. Read it at tinyurl.com slash TPP Biggest Deal. Corporations are people? Money is speech? The U.S. Supreme Court for more than the past century has ruled that corporations have constitutional rights as if they were flesh and blood people like you and I and since 1976 have repeatedly ruled that for political purposes money is speech. In January of 2010 they ruled in Citizens United versus the FEC that corporations can spend corporate funds directly on so-called independent campaigns and the floodgates were opened. We want our democracy back. We can take our democracy back from the plutocrats and the corporations by amending the U.S. Constitution to make clear that corporations are not people and that money is not speech. Join us now in this new democracy movement and support amending the Constitution. Learn more at movetomend.org or here in Portland, Oregon at movetomendpdx.org. And join the democracy movement with the Alliance for Democracy in Portland, AFD, Dash pdx.org and nationally at the alliance for democracy.org. All right, let's get this done. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Please learn more by visiting our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today for being here and getting us on the air. Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to you, the audience, for watching. We hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye now.